Hello, everybody. Today we are doing a chill Q&A hangout. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't take an art class, we've got everything you need to our art prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Today's chill hangout is going to be extra chill because <laughs> I got sick this week and I took a sick day took a really nice four hour nap, but still got to keep it pretty chill. <laughs> I'll be operating at 50% prof Lu energy today, which I don't know what that looks like, but you're all going to get to see it in just about a minute. Actually, I can show some of you some of the goodies that have been arriving because in case you missed it right now is our fall raffle this is going through saturday december 9th and one of the ways you can enter the raffle is to buy something off of one of our amazon wish lists so let, let's take a look at what's been coming oh <laughs> you guys will like to see the really big one all right, let's look at this. Let's see what's in here. Ooh. This is Creta Color charcoal powder. Familiar, but necessary. And I got one just yesterday. Oh, here it is. It's in a cute little Amazon wrapped container. Let's see what's in here. Because one of the things that's really nice about the raffle is oftentimes you guys ask me, oh, can you do a tutorial about this material? But materials cost money. So if you guys buy me something, or, or you can even suggest, like if you want to tell me in the chat, oh yeah, I'd love to see a video about this, you can tell me and I can put it on the wish list. Because this is a material that I've never used before, actually, but I've been curious about for a really long time and that is ooh, look at this liquid charcoal like i i don't know what the heck this is at all has anybody used this before because the words don't make like liquid charcoal what is this well actually let's open it how does this thing function I cannot open containers. Okay, let's see. Weird. Let's see. Oh, that's funny. It's like a little tube. Well, hang on a second. Let's open this up. Weird. Oh, oh it's coming out. I mean, it, it looks like paint but I'm very curious to try it. In fact, I don't really know what people typically use it for. Okay, well, the box just says paint with charcoal. All right, I guess we're doing a demo on how to use liquid charcoal. I might do some Googling too, because maybe there's a lot about this that I don't know. Tell me in the chat, do you know what I'm talking? I have no idea what this is. I just have seen it in the art stores and I've been curious. So that's why I put it on my Amazon wish list. That's kind of fun. Because there's never enough art supplies. Never. <laughs> Actually, you want to see the really big one? And by the way, if you give a super chat or a super sticker during the stream, that also enters you into the raffle. Because guess what? I want everybody to think about this for one minute. We don't have paywalls. If you want to watch our videos, you just watch them. We don't charge you anything. And it's a very bad business model. But I have always felt very strongly from the very first day, you can ask Lauren, she was there at the beginning, 
that our content stays free and accessible. Bad business model though, because we have a lot of expenses and they gotta come from somewhere. And so that's where when people jump in, give $5, give $10, it's a world of a difference because our budget is tight enough that honestly, $50 helps us a lot. I mean, some companies maybe it doesn't matter, but for us, it's like $75 has an impact. So think about it. I know not everybody can do it, but it's incredibly helpful for us to have your support because the no paywall thing is, is basically, I mean, we could set up a paywall, but our budget problems would be over, but I don't want to. And so that's where we need people to step in. Amanda says you can apply liquid charcoal to charcoal drawings without having to make wet charcoal and make a gigantic mess. Oh, so maybe you start with a dry charcoal drawing and then you add liquid? Yeah, Anna, it looks like black paint, but I don't know. I'll try it on a live stream. <laughs> Banana Nut says, just got charcoal pencils to try for the first time. I'm not really ready for liquid yet. <laughs> charcoal pencils, I like them in very small quantities. I don't know. They're always sort of inconsistent. There's always one that has a little hard spot and then it scrapes into my paper. It's not my favorite thing. Thank you so much, Adesua. And also Jen for the super stickers. Jen says, thank you for not having a paywall. Well, we so much appreciate your support, everybody. Because I'm very proud that we have been without paywalls for almost 10 years. Did you guys know next year is our 10 year anniversary? And it's been a slog to keep it that way, but I want to keep it that way. Okay, you guys want to see, you want to see the dramatic raffle item? I can't even take the whole thing out. It's, it's, I'm not going to unbox it yet because I'm going to do an official unboxing, but look at this. See this? It's pretty heavy too. Look at this thing. Any guesses? Does anybody think they know what this is? Let's just say I put it on my Amazon wish list, thinking nobody's ever going to buy this, but they did. And oh my gosh, I'm going to make a whole new series of videos because of this item that I'm really excited about. There's another one here. This one is not as big. It's a lot lighter. It's this one. See? Uh, this one, I don't think is going to be so much a teaching tool as much as it is going to liven up my studio space. <laughs> I'll do an unboxing of this one, too. Oh, in my dreams that it's an iPad. I mean, it's a pretty big iPad. I don't think I'm going to be able to get one, though. There's too many other expenses we need to cover first, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, some good guesses. Adesua says maybe a mini easel. And thank you so much. Be contoshous. So happy to have you here. And also Anna for the super chat. I'm so grateful to all of you who have supported us. And I don't like that I have to keep asking people to support us. I'm dreaming of the day. I don't have to do that, but that's what we need to do. When you give away a lot of free content, you have to cover your expenses somehow. <laughs> By the way, everybody, this is a Q and A as well. So if anybody has questions, anything you wanna pick my brain about, I am happy to talk about that because while I love our focus live streams to really target a specific idea, it is really nice because people just have so many questions that are from all over the place that oftentimes just don't fit into a live stream. And of course, I'm over in the Discord, which I love, 
but it is very different when I get to answer questions on voice. It's easier, actually. Alexandria points out, I love the availability of quality art speak free. So happy you do. I can't believe sometimes I look at or things pop up in my Instagram feed for online courses and stuff. And some of them are really expensive. I mean, I don't know what's actually involved in those online classes, but some of them is sort of astonishing. And a lot of them don't even have direct interaction with the instructor. It's like, here, you get videos for this amount. And it's like, to me, teaching is not passive. And it seems like most of the online teaching that I see the models are for passive income that as the instructor, you put up these videos, you're done. And then you just keep bringing in money. I mean, what we do is very hands-on and it's 10 times more work, but in my opinion, a lot more effective. Who here sees that interaction? Because of course, if you're self-taught, you're just looking at YouTube, sometimes you don't want the interaction, right? You just want to go get the information. But to really get to that next step in terms of your improvement, that interaction is absolutely necessary, that feedback is necessary. How many people here have been in that place where you just are so alone in your little artist universe and you're in your head and you don't know what to do next and it's like Ugh! it's so hard and you need that feedback you need somebody to give you perspective on what's actually happening in your painting because you can't it's your own painting Zah says, adding backgrounds before beginning the work, after completion, during. How to get over the fear of them. Thanks for the Q&A. Thank you, Zah. And thank you so much, Diane, again, for the soup. All right, let's get to the question. Before beginning the work, after completion, during. How to get over the fear of them. I think backgrounds have to begin at the very beginning. It would be like if you did a portrait and you just didn't paint one of the eyes until much later, because that is really common, especially if you're doing something like a portrait or let's say a figure and you know you want that portrait to be the main event. And so you, you spend all your time in that portrait and then when you're done, you go, oh, shoot, maybe I should put it in the background. That's not good because the background is not just there to fill the space. And I think that's one of the mistakes people make with backgrounds is they think it's just there to fill, but it's not. There are so many paintings where the backgrounds are critically important to how the painting comes across. And the example I would give you, think about any movie that you've seen recently. Name some movies you guys have seen recently. I haven't, oh, actually the latest one I saw was The Killer with Michael Fassbender, of course. <laughs> but think about the last movie you saw and ask yourself where that movie took place. Because in The Killer, there's a bunch of scenes in Paris and you could say, okay, well, he's in Paris, that's the background. Or you could say, oh, he is in Australia. That's the background. I, I, Paris and Australia are such different things and they really impact the story. Michael Fassbender in Australia is not the same story as Michael Fassbender in Paris. Maybe in Australia, he's meeting up with Hugh Jackman. So that, that's the main thing is that you can't tell yourself that the background is separate from everything else that's happening. It has to show up in your thumbnails and it should be influential content wise. So it's not just, oh, is the background blue? It's, okay, this is Paris. And you could say, okay, this is 17th century Paris. And we're looking at somebody who's very wealthy. Or you could say, okay, this is in the slums of this part of the city. I, I'm actually 
surprised that people don't use backgrounds more to their advantage. I know they're intimidating, but once you start using them, you start to realize how much they can enrich the work that you were doing. Undecided says, do many art orgs run similarly with no paywalls? I am not the ultimate authority, but if you guys look at YouTube, a lot of the channels are just putting out content to get you to buy stuff. Some of them are free, but we're complicated because we have seven staff members. I mean, that, that's a lot. <laughs> we have to pay our staff. It gets expensive very fast. Zal says, Art Renewal Center is sort of paywall free. You can see standard res versions of the classical library paid workshops. Yeah, we do have paid workshops as well, but we have a ton of content. Like all our videos, they're free. We don't have any videos at all that are behind a paywall. Okay, so they're saying, I'm in grad school. My online classes are literally watching recorded lectures and doing homework, but I'm in finance, so I'm not sure if it's super different. I think that's very common now. A lot of online classes don't have the get down in the trenches nitty gritty <laughs> that we like to do. I mean, basically, we just don't have, we, we make everything 10 times more work and we make it free. So just take a guess what that does to your budget. But we all know the real reason behind the raffle is to save Lauren. <laughs> save Lauren from my wrath. So if you guys want to help Lauren out, you need to save her through the raffle. That's that's really budget, whatever. We got to save Lauren. Ginger says, so grateful you guys have so much free content. I've learned so much from you guys. Thank you, Ginger. And I've loved so much. So many of you have been with us for so long. Some of you are here. You leave for a while. You come back. You leave again. And that's the way I like to think about it is that we're just here for you. And you hang out with us when you feel like it. And you leave for a little bit. You come back. We welcome you back with open arms. That's very important, I think that you guys feel that we are a solid base for you to return to and that you don't have to feel any obligation to stick around. Really good point from Iron Earth. I think interaction is really important A support. Exactly. Being alone, trying to do it is much harder. How many people have been in that situation where you just are so isolated as an artist? I'm lucky that I went to art school, I have a community of peers and former professors, students that I've had, but I do think the vast majority of artists on the planet don't have that and are looking for that community. So that's where we are here to fill that gap. Amber says, I'm going to seriously peruse an art career and I'm terrified. I totally get it. It's a big concept. <laughs> be like, if I say I'm going to be an athlete, oh, the, the, <laughs> there's a reason that's not a career option for me right now. The recommendation I would give you, Amber, people don't realize that having an art career begins with research. It doesn't begin with the art. It doesn't begin with you because you have to understand what the industry that you are wanting to work on is, how it functions. And that's anything from understanding what the current trends are, but even really nitty gritty things like how to submit your portfolio. There are some places where they want a Google slideshow. Other times they want a PDF. And sometimes that really depends on the industry. So what I find is a lot of people have a concept of wanting to start an art career, but at least in the very beginning, it oftentimes does feel really vague. And I think because it feels vague, that's why it feels terrifying. So what I would recommend to you, Amber, try to sort out what part of that industry you want to work in, because a lot of people will say to me, oh, I want to do illustration. And I'll say, okay, but what part of illustration? They're like, oh, everything. 
I'm like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> There's so many pieces to illustration. There's comics, children's books, editorial, so many different sections. And it's almost like every section of illustration is a different field. The organization of it is different. The way artists function is different. So we can help you with that, Amber, especially in the Discord, or if you want to ask me questions right now. But that's the important thing is you've got to do your research. And sometimes after doing research, people realize, wow, that's not really the field I want to go into. Because I thought it was this, but actually it turns out it's this. And that's okay. I had students in school. They would go into graphic design thinking they wanted to do it. They would go into the graphic design department and realize, oh my gosh, I don't like this. Jen says, I'm even in the Discord server. Good. But I still spend too much time in my head. I think I'm afraid of critique still. Who isn't? <laughs> I'm still, like, I always have that little tinge. <laughs> Anytime I'm going to show somebody something that I made, I've been critiqued a billion times. But it's always that little, uh, that little moment that really gets to you. For example, I was working on that Aaron Tveit painting. And I was having a lot of trouble with it, the proportions and everything. And I showed it to Mia and Kat because I was like, that's it. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> My brain is destroying itself from the inside. And I, I did have that moment where I was like, Ugh. but it was good. They, they helped me a lot. And it was actually very funny because they thought, I thought the head was too big. And I thought the legs were too long, but they actually said to me, actually, the feet are too small. And in retrospect, because the feet were too small, they made the head look too big. Isn't that funny? You think, oh, the head is too big. It must be the head that needs to get fixed. No, it was the shoes. And I would never have seen that. They also noted that the elbow had like two elbows. <laughs> I like, didn't even think about it. Thank you so much, Is, for the soup. How do you get back into art? Let's sketch practices, fun activities that also make you practice. Do you recommend? Thank you for all that you do. Yeah, that's a really important question. I think sometimes, again, it's sort of getting over that initial fence to get back into it. We do have a ton of videos that are sketchbook prompts. And I think people like those because they're really simple. They're not difficult, but they're within your sketchbook. So they still feel really low key and they don't feel like you're starting something. I mean, one of the sketchbook prompts, draw what's in front of you. I know that sounds really silly, but it's like, there's a command there that you just do. And because it's your sketchbook, it's not a big deal. So if you go to our prof.org and you click on the search bar, just type in sketchbook prompts and you'll find them all there. Banana Nut says, self-taught in that early learn all the things simultaneously phase it makes me dizzy sometimes. Oh, I know. It's so overwhelming, isn't it? Because I think there's a really big gap between knowing you want to work on something. Like, let's say, oh, I want to get better at color. Okay. That's the goal. But to go from that to actually doing something is really a big leap for a lot and people don't know how to get from one thing to the next for good reason i mean <laughs> unless you're a teacher <laughs> which you're not that's why you're there my recommendation is going to be for you to try our tracks because our tracks are a sequence of video lessons and prompts and so it tells you exactly what to do in what order and i think you would like those a lot they're on our website by the way everybody What's your art prop dinner? <laughs> because we have a very big menu at Art Prof. We have so many things that we offer. Live streams, free reference photo collection, Discord, slideshows, tracks, curriculums. What is your art prop dinner? I would like to know. Because you know what? Art prop dinners are free. We pay for your art prop dinners all year long. You just come in, dinner's on the house. 
So this one time, we want you to pay for one appetizer, not even the whole meal, one appetizer, that's it. And so if you enter the raffle, you cover that one appetizer for us one time. And again, in case you missed it, if you give a super chat or sticker during the stream, that will enter you into the raffle. We've got a question here from Thundering Spring. Do you have any recommended resources for learning to photograph sculptures on a black background? I'm really struggling with lighting that don't make the objects look super different. We have a big page on rpref.org and it has everything you need. We have slideshows with examples. We have walkthrough demos. So just type into rprof.org. Is it photographing or photograph? Just type in photographing your art, photograph your art, one or the other, and it'll take you to that. But I can tell you Thundering Spring, spring black backgrounds usually are not good for 3D art. You'd think they would be because you would say to yourself, oh, if I have black in the background and let's just pretend you have a white sculpture, oh, that's going to be the best contrast. Actually, it's not. For 3D work, I always recommend to people have a neutral background. So like a medium gray or maybe a dark medium gray. Having black is actually very hard because the contrast is too strong. So I suspect that if you switch to something that's a medium gray, or it could even be, it depends on the color of the sculpture though. I would recommend a different color based on the color of the sculpture, but sometimes even off white is better. Sometimes white makes it look really flat. It's very tricky. But if you go to that page on our website, it has everything that you need to know and you can always follow up with questions in the Discord. Yes, we are going to be introducing winter workshops, probably after the holidays. And those are so much fun. I love hanging out with you guys. Look at this. You guys love this. This is Cat's Art Prof Dinner. I just love this. <laughs> of course, it's all India ink with squid ink pasta. I thought this was just so brilliant. Yeah, Meisuko says, Lauren also has the best art student videos. Did, did people enjoy Lauren behaving like the world's most obnoxious art student? Do you guys want to see more? Because, oh boy, I've got 15 years of obnoxious art student stories. <laughs> I'm coming to the East Coast in March. So we're probably gonna do another round of in-person shoots. And I was thinking it'd be really fun if we just had art student parody sketches. <laughs> we actually did shoot a bunch that were parodying art teachers that were pretty funny. And don't forget, this is a very special prize because three people are going to win it. Now, the other prizes, it's like one person, three people. So if you pledge 50, Mia's going to draw your cartoon. Like, it's so funny. <laughs> like, how did she make it look so much like Dorian? I, I don't know how she does it. But yeah, if you pledge 50, and not a lot of people have done that. So actually the chances of you getting it are pretty high now because three people have, are gonna get the prize. Well, thank you, Sai. Glad our videos have helped you. Clementine says, time zones exist. How do the workshops work? What times are they held? I usually hold them on Saturday from 12 Eastern to three Eastern. Usually that's able to get people in the US and also people in Europe. I think that's an evening time. That seems to be a good time for a lot of people and for me as well. So yeah, you can get information if you go to rprof.org and click on workshops in the menu bar, you, the, all the information is there. Well, Alexandra, you don't have to develop a community. We have one. <laughs> you can just join ours. It's really easy. 
Iron Man is asking, strengthening artistic voice. It seems like a goal to aspire to, so as not to include 5 million ideas in one piece of art. Should beginners use the series idea to guide their work or too soon? I don't recommend it usually for a beginner because usually if you're just getting started, a lot of people like to feel that they have some degree of skill under their belt. And the whole thing about a series, which is challenging, not only developing the materials, but you also have to engage in terms of the content. And that's oftentimes a lot to balance. And so I don't really recommend doing that in the very beginning. But I would recommend that any beginner that you don't separate brainstorming and skill. That's a big mistake. How many people have heard this? I'm just curious because I, I like to know where this comes from, actually. People will say, I have to learn technique first. I have to learn how to draw realistically. And then when I, once I've learned that, then I will start to do brainstorming. Have people heard that? I hear that all the time. And I think that's such a big mistake because it makes you really lopsided. So you end up with somebody who's really skilled, but who has no idea how to engage with their content. And I saw it in my graduate school. I saw people who had just stunning technique, way better than anything I could ever do. But I mean, it almost felt embarrassing to me that the ideas behind their work were just so basic compared to the richness of their skill. And so I would rather have somebody be doing both brainstorming and gaining their skill and both of them not being that great, but then that they grow together. Then somebody like gets stellar skill and then wait later for the brainstorming. So that's more what I would recommend. Anna says, how do you not let rejections define your worth as an artist? What tools do you use as a bulwark against changing tides in the art world? Oh dear, it's so hard. I mean, being an artist, it is such a hustle. And there are days where I just look at it and I think to myself, I can't do this anymore. This is just so exhausting. And it's hard because it actually doesn't have a lot to do with how good of an artist you are, where you are creatively. It's all just something that weighs on you from a mental point of view. This sounds really bad, and I, I really mean this in a positive manner. You almost have to sort of not care anymore and to a certain degree give up on certain things because I used to get really, really hung up on certain things and I just drive myself crazy. It was not good. But the thing I can tell you, Anna, is it is very important to keep testing the waters in different places. Because I think what hurt me the most was in retrospect, I realized I had such tunnel vision when it came to where I thought my work could live. And because I, I had such a limited view of where it could be, I wasn't giving other things a chance. It could be that this was all a really long time ago. I mean, this is before social media was what it is today. And I do think social media has made more things more possible. For example, I had a student who had all these bird pieces that she loved making. And the fine artist part of you probably says, okay, I need to find a gallery that will show my bird drawings. And I said to her, you know, go to the people that love birds, go to the Audubon Society, show there. I mean, those are people that are really going to like it. 
And so I think sometimes as artists, it's like we just look in the artist bubble and that's where we get in trouble because that art bubble's tiny. It's, it's not very big. By the way, everybody, if you join our Patreon group, this also enters you into the raffle. This is a great group of people. Some of them have been there for years. We have weekly voice sessions with me. You can bring your art to be critiqued. I write long, nerdy critiques. It's a small group of artists. It's so much easier to get to know people. I love our public discord, but it's got 11,000 people in it. It's hard to make closer connections. And the Patreon group is a lot easy. And we don't have the three comment to one artwork critique rule that we have in the public channels. Sai says, I'm applying for an MA in fine art, updating my CV. I've added all details about past education exhibitions. What in your eyes is the most important thing to include? You just have to make sure that it's all art related. For example, if you had another job in a totally different field, you don't need to include that. I think sometimes people do too much of that. And also, I, I don't know what your CV looks like, so I can't give you really specific advice. But one thing that I do notice that comes across as padding, sometimes people, let's say you are part of artist co-op. A lot of artist co-ops will have, say, a thing in their membership where, okay, there's an annual member show every year. And what I see sometimes on CVs, which is a big turnoff, is that they'll just list that members exhibition 2020, members exhibition 2021, members exhibition. It's like, you don't have to put all those in there. Like, yeah, maybe you participated in 10 of them, but just list it twice or something. I, I think it's more about making sure whatever's in there doesn't look like you're just trying to make your resume longer because you can spot that from a mile away. I'd much rather see a CV that's short and that has stuff that really has substance than something like that. Undecided Toy Store says, how do you like being the founder and leader of Art Prof versus being a professor in academia? I've heard so many crazy stories of the downsides of being in academia. <laughs> how much time you guys got? <laughs> if you want the whole sob story, type into YouTube, Art Prof, why I left RISD. <laughs> I'm not going to get too much into it right now, but all I can say is there's a reason I'm here. And it was very hard for me to leave academia. I wanted to be in academia my whole life. It was always my dream. And I walked away from it. I mean, can you imagine what that's like? It's like you work towards something your whole life. But I knew once I hit about 35, your ship starts sailing and I, I could read the room and it was really hard and really depressing. But the system for adjunct faculty is extremely exploitative and it was just constant anxiety all the time. And I think a field where they value less the people that have more experience, that's a problem. I'm like, really? So they, they sort of, the, in a nutshell, you get too old. They don't care if you're a good teacher or not. You, you are not fun anymore because <laughs> you're at a certain age. And certainly there are exceptions. There are some people that get hired when they're older. But I realized after a little while, as I applied all these academia jobs, I noticed the people that were getting the jobs were like way younger than me they were out of grad school like two years and once i started seeing that pattern i was like that's it it's over so yeah i left <laughs> best decision but it was a very hard decision for me to make it was very emotional Adesua says can you get into the editorial illustration area of work with a sketchy or not vector style oh of course there's illustration of all different styles if you look up, I'll type it into the chat, look up Ralph Stedman. He is one of 
the most renowned illustrators out there. He, he's been around for a very long time. He's not new. His work is all sketchy. Spontaneous ink splats and, or another person, I'll type this into the chat too, Edward Corin. Or, oh, you know who I really like? Type this in, Edward Steed. I know you see a lot of vector stuff that is trending right now in editorial illustration, but it's not the only way to do illustration. I mean, I think that's what happens is stuff gets trendy. And so people assume, oh, that's the only thing that the illustration industry wants. It's not that, it's you have to find the right spot for it because you'll find that different magazines that they have different styles. For example, I was doing some research because I was putting together my freelance illustration portfolio. And I noticed that Time Magazine, they have very realistic illustration, realistic color paintings. That's what they do. If you look at the New Yorker, they're not like that at all. They are famous for their cartoons. And a lot of the work they do is more graphic and more stylized. So a big part of editorial illustration is you have to research the publications and figure out, oh, what kind of illustrations do they like? And is that a good fit for me? All right, we got some art prof dinners. Discord, reference photo, curriculums, Q&A. Yes, and by the way, everybody, thank you, Blue, who was a wonderful mod in our Discord. If you can't support us in the fall raffle, and I understand that, that that's why we're here. <laughs> we're here to help those of you who can't do it. But if you leave a comment, even if it's an emoji, like you don't have to write anything long. YouTube doesn't care if it's an essay or if it's one emoji. If you guys hit the like button, if you leave a comment on any of our videos, that helps us. We'll the algorithms. So that is the way to help us if you cannot contribute. William is asking, when are you doing, when do are doing a large scale painting? How do you plan it out and choose your subjects? Tons of thumbnails, so many thumbnails. <laughs> the last really big painting I did was that Moulin Rouge commission, the one with the green fairy. And you would not believe the amount of prep work that went into that. Choosing my subject, I mean, lately I've had this fixation with air to me. So he's just all over my radar. And the way I feel about subjects is you don't always plan for them. Sometimes it just come up and it's like right there and you go, oh, I'll do that. So sometimes it's just out of the blue. You can go looking for sure. I did that for my MFA thesis because I had a big project and I knew I had to come up with something and that actually made it really hard. And so I actually ended up making the thesis about searching that I was looking for something. I didn't know what it was, but I kept looking and it turned into the digging series because the digging was a gesture for searching for things, but not knowing where they were. So it ended up <laughs> just fine. And other times the subject picks you. Other times there's some context. I mean, I did this drawing of my child. This is not really a big painting, but that was on a live stream. I've had a couple pieces that I started on live streams, didn't have any intention to develop them further, but then did because there was something that came up that I really liked about the piece. So you don't always know, but it's okay to be patient with that. But yeah, large scale painting is just a crazy number of thumbnail sketches. And I'll also do mini painting studies. So not a thumbnail. Okay. Thumbnails are small. But I'll do, I'm trying to see if I have one here, but I don't. So if I'm doing a really big painting, maybe I'll do like a 12 by 16 painting study, quick, sketchy. It's all about 
troubleshooting and testing things before you get into the final, because that's where things get difficult. If you're doing a very big painting and you didn't prep enough, and all of a sudden you got to move things around, it's a ton of work to do that, to paint over things. It's such a hassle. So it's a lot better to do obsessive <laughs> thumbnailing. <laughs> oh, Carolyn's asking about an East Coast meetup. I'll have to see. I don't know what the schedule will be like. The problem with the East Coast is when I get over there, everybody wants to see me. So it's hard for me to pick one city. I'll see. We haven't done one in Boston before, though. It'd be fun. Yeah, how many people here have been to a meetup? Because I love that. It's just the sweetest thing to meet you guys. I did one in New York, Toronto, Rhode Island. It'd be so fun to see you guys. Thank you so much, Tammy, for the super chat. That does enter you into the raffle. In my 50s debating school, art school, art degree, random classes, I'm at the age it probably wouldn't be a second career, but maybe so, where to turn? Depends on your life situation, but based on the information you're giving me, I wouldn't recommend a degree. A degree oftentimes is, I mean, I mean at least in the US, is prohibitively expensive. And you do have to be able to just drop everything and do that. So if you have any amount of responsibilities beyond yourself, it's usually not a good option for people. There's so many ways you can fill things in for yourself. I mean, we have curriculums which give you the overview. Like somebody who wants to do illustration, I would look at the illustration curriculum because some people look at it and go, oh, that's illustration? I thought it was this. And so that's the research part. But then when you find out what you want to do, there's the gaining of the skills. And we have a lot of programs for people. I mean, some, a lot of them are free. Like you can work on a track, post your progress in Discord. And we have workshops. And we also have, as I was talking about earlier, is our Patreon group, which is a really great place for you to get support for myself and the staff. And we really target what you want to do. And that I think provides a lot of flexibility. <coughs> and also makes it so you don't waste your time with stuff because a lot of degree programs, you would be doing that. You'd be taking a lot of classes that maybe you're not so interested in. Oh, wow, I'm really behind on comments. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <laughs> but uh, I'll try to get through these. Oh, Za, I, I really like the way you're putting this. Social media has been a great equalizer in the art world. Professional resources like Art Prof, huge for so many of us. Oh, it levels the playing field. I've had so many people who've worked with us and had really good success, have exhibitions, done open studios. And I know a lot of those events are very intimidating. And if you have somebody just there to help you prep for you to understand, okay, here are the most important things and these things don't matter. How many people here I've wanted to do something as an artist, have a show, have open studios, sell in an art fair, sell online. How many of you have some art goal, but then it's like, where do I begin? I don't know. And I think that's just what a lot of artists are dealing with is they just don't have that little art fairy <laughs> to help them with things that are really important. I mean, if I just tell you guys four things about an art fair, I could save you six hours of grief. <laughs> it's really that simple. Carlos says, I'm currently a junior at School of the Arts to Chicago, plan to apply to Yale for their MFA in painting. Seeing your video with Leila Fay, but do you have any tips for creating a Yale worthy portfolio? Don't think about it as a Yale worthy portfolio. Think about it as the best portfolio you can put together. I would also tell you, Carlos, and I'm not trying to be a bummer. Everybody 
who applies to an MFA is applying to Yale in painting. So while it's fine to aspire to that, the numbers are so alarming. And at a certain point when the numbers are that competitive, it actually doesn't have a lot to do with you because everybody's qualified at that point. So I do recommend expanding your reach, different programs. The most important thing is that you demonstrate maturity, that it doesn't look like a patchwork quilt of undergraduate assignments. And I would recommend to join our art school portfolios groups because I get so many questions about applying to MFAs, but the fact of the matter is there's such a limit to what you can do in terms of getting people feedback. And you'll find if you join the group and you actually get feedback, it's a world of a difference. It's 30 to $40 a month. And I'm in there giving people paragraphs of customized feedback because the general advice is great, but it's like, it only goes so far. So if you're interested, this, I think is the best course. It's the biggest bang for your buck out of everything that we offer. We have one-on-one -on -one services. You can buy a portfolio critique. You can buy an artist call, but this, this gets you so much for not a lot of money. Geneva says, how do you decide which thumbnail sketch to choose to be your final one? It's tricky. <laughs> Actually, Geneva, what works the best, honestly, process of elimination. I look at the thumbnails and I just say, which one do I not like? Okay, definitely don't like this one. Okay, what's the next one I don't like? Yeah, not this one. And it, it works surprisingly well. I mean, people oftentimes think you should just be able to be like, oh, that's the star thumbnail. But no, it's just this is the one that's the least bad. <laughs> that's what I do. It helps to get feedback too. You show it to me or one of the staff or in the Patreon group, you can ask the community. That's another way to go. But I can tell you that I oftentimes do not make that decision by myself. I pretty much always ask people. Yeah, West Coast. Well, actually, you guys, I'm going to be in LA in May. So maybe we can do an LA meetup. Anybody here near LA? That would be fun because I, yeah, we haven't done one on the West Coast. Oh, good. I'm so glad, Is I can't help it. It's compulsive. I, I can't do a halfway thing. It bothers me. And so I will actively take time out of my personal life. <laughs> Here's an example. So when I was teaching printmaking at RISD, they have all these printmaking blotters and they get damp and everything. And I always got stressed that they weren't hung correct. I don't know why. Like, I actually had a nightmare that I forgot to hang the blotters and they were all ruined the next day. <laughs> but so I would always spend like an extra 10 minutes, like making sure the blotters were correctly hung. <laughs> because I, I just think it's a big disservice if I give you half advice. Do people ever get that where it's like you get some advice, but it's not enough to resolve your question <laughs> or when advice is so vague. Like if I hear somebody say, be yourself one more time, I just am like, no, that's not helpful. Not at all. People need something a lot more concrete and actionable. Remember, we have been paying for all your art prof dinners all year. You haven't to pay for a single meal. We just let you in and you just go into our buffet of anatomy and slideshows and critiques and discord stuff. Can you guys just pay for one appetizer? Just this one time, once a year, actually twice a year. <laughs> we do two raffles, but just this one time, just buy one appetizer. That's it. And 
all the other meals beyond today, we're still going to pay for them. But if you guys can do one thing for us, that would be incredibly helpful because remember, we have no paywalls. You don't pay for a single thing to watch any video with us. And I'm very proud of that, that we've been able to sustain that for so long. And it's very important to me. But we have a lot of expenses, a lot of expenses that people just don't know about that need to be covered. And honestly, the people who support us on Patreon, that is the vast majority of our budget. If you take away the Patreon people, we go under overnight. And the raffles are the extra cushion to make sure I don't die in my sleep every night. Explosaurus says, what are some art careers that are more peripheral? I'm thinking curation, restoration. Are there other positions like this you can think of and how is pursuing them different? I don't think I would consider them peripheral. I think I would just consider them to be not as well known because being a curator, you need an art history PhD. That's a major field, being an art curator. And there's actually some master's programs, like BARD has a center for curatorial studies. But most art curators, the assumption is you have an art history PhD, and a PhD is years of study. Restoration probably goes under conservation science. And that is, again, another thing. You have to have a degree. They won't let you work in there without a degree. So that's the important thing again, the research to understand, hey, what do I need to get to be qualified to work in this field? Now, some art fields doesn't matter. You just have the portfolio and it's fine. Nobody cares. But for a curator, absolutely. The curatorial stuff, whole other field. It's You think it was super related to the studio hands-on part, but it's really not. It's a totally different field altogether. What's a good point from Anna? I don't agree with social media being the great equalizer. If you are young, able-bodied, conventionally attractive, and cis, you definitely have advantages on social. Yeah. I mean, if you guys had seen, Lauren showed me the ceramicist dude who's like super buff. And of course, he's super popular on Instagram, of course. But I also know some people who have done very well on social media who don't fit that. It's not as many. I totally get it. But I do think if you think about it the way it was before, that so many people who have stuff going on now, I'm not just talking about art. I'm talking about comedians or who is it? Is it Lily Singh who used to be on YouTube, started on YouTube and now has her own late night show. So yes, there, there's advantages for certain people with certain things. But I think when I think about how before, if you weren't Martin Scorsese, you never had a chance of doing anything with video. Um, it, it's all obviously relative, but it's a good point you bring up. Comcuke says, any tips for getting the most out of your sketchbook? Is there a best method or process to using it for learning. My sketchbook advice is, I'll show you mine. It's a mess. <laughs> Don't care what it looks like. Just be whatever it wants to be. I think it's just when people get precious here, you guys want to see a flip through. It's so boring. Look at this. It's super boring. <laughs> I mean, most of my sketchbook is writing. There's not a lot of art in here, actually. I, I guess there's like a random blotch of paint. Oh, here we go. There's some art. <laughs> there's a thumbnail. Look, this is like the only page <laughs> with thumbnails. But I would just say, Comcuke, you got to have a sketchbook that doesn't make you nervous, that doesn't make you feel like you have to do a great job. I mean, this is a freaking meat pie. It does not look dumb. It looks terrible. Oh, look, this one's really, oh God, I don't even want to show this to you guys. It's so bad. Here's another Sweeney Todd. This one's a little better, but it's still not great. Here's a really scary looking Josh Groban. 
but this is my sketchbook. I know it's it's not that exciting, but I need my sketchbook to be this way. If my sketchbook is anything more pronounced or finished than this, I can't deal. <laughs> yeah, you guys, like 5% of my sketchbook, <laughs> like there's an eye. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's how you get the most is you don't limit yourself to having it be a certain way. Like I didn't realize there's so much emphasis on finishing a sketchbook. Have you guys noticed that? And honestly, I can't remember the last time I finished a sketchbook. I never finished them. So I, I don't understand all the emphasis on that because honestly, I don't really care if I finish my sketchbook. So William is asking, how do I join the Patreon? Okay, well, what you want to do is you just go to artprof.org. In fact, I should probably show you the website. That probably would be more helpful. By the way, speaking of the website, how many people have been to artprof.org? Because there's actually a ton of information here that's not on YouTube. So if you haven't looked at it, take a look. And really, this is the best way to use it. So if you go in here and you just type in Patreon group. Whoops. Why does that not come up? Oh my gosh. Okay, I need to fix that. Okay, so just go into the main menu bar, go to join the ArtProf family, there it is, and click on Patreon group. So if you go here, and we have a link in the video description below. So if you go down, you'll find it as well. And so this tells you exactly what to do. Well, I'm so sad that that search bar didn't work for the Patreon group. That's so weird because the search bar usually is really good. Anyway. Let's see. ComQuk says, do you feel it's important for artists to be well-versed in our history? I find it very bland. Oh, I do. I really do. And honestly, that's not uncommon, ComQuk, for people to find our history boring. But it does not need to be. It's only boring if you go to boring websites. And art history is really behind. It is usually taught as the stuffy white male who's 70 years old talking about white men <laughs> in history. And there, there's not a lot of options which is why look at our art history stuff. I, I like to think we make art history fun, but again, we have a whole art history section on artprof.org. And what we try to do is to make it more accessible. So it's not so stuffy because, oh God, if I read an art history book, it's, maybe I should do that when I can't fall asleep. <laughs> but it's very important, ComQuk, to understand what came before you and I get it. Instagram's very handy for looking stuff up. But guess what? Rembrandt's not on Instagram. Yeah, he's on some of the museum sites. But there's just so many artists out there that nobody knows about because they're not on Instagram. And so when you guys look for art history and artists to look at, you can't just look at Instagram. You can't just look at a Google search. You have to get to a library and you have to look at things. I had a short where I went to the library and I just sat there and I just looked at books. You can just do that. I love books. <laughs> I miss books actually. Do that, really. And we do have a video. Let's see if I can find it. It, it is on artprof.org. So here, I'll show you guys where our history stuff is. Okay, so if you go to artprof.org, 
and you go to the menu bar and you go under pro development, there is a section here, contemporary art and art history. So if you click on that, we have all these various types of streams, but the one that I would start with is how to start learning art history. So here we give you tips for how to get started in a way that's not overwhelming and that's not boring. <laughs> so I recommend looking at this page. And let's see. Explosora says, I think what I really meant was where my work wouldn't be the focus, more of a support role. I didn't mean to lessen the importance or complexity of those positions. Okay, my brain is mush and I totally don't remember <laughs> what the earlier comment was. Explosaurus, I'm sorry. If you wanna <laughs> repost. <laughs> yeah, this is a good comment from DC. Somebody had mentioned earlier about ways to get the most out of your sketchbook. And they say, yep, just use it for whatever you need and don't feel pressured to make it a showpiece. Just draw and learn, enjoy, exactly. Lionel says, I've been very bad at sketchbooking. I haven't done it in a long time. Guys, I don't have a sketchbook practice. You saw my sketchbook. It's just random. It's <laughs> This is not a sketchbook practice. I know people talk about having a sketchbook practice. I'm too scatterbrained to have one. I did when I was in school but not anymore. <laughs> Good point from Peppermint. Art history is boring when you have to read a dry textbook for class, but it's interesting otherwise. It's fascinating. It's the most extraordinary topic, which is why it's a bummer that a lot of the ways it's been formatted is number one, not inclusive, and also just how, how could you take such a fascinating topic and make it so boring? I don't understand. So this is not anyone's fault. It's the fault of the people that have been putting together the art history content. Oh, by the way, before we get to this question, you guys want to see more unboxing? <laughs> so somebody sent me this. Here, I'll show you. So another way you can enter the raffle is you can buy something off of our Amazon wish list, and the ra raffle link is in the YouTube video description below. So let's see. And especially sometimes people will ask about certain supplies, and so I'll put it on the Amazon wish list if you want me to do a tutorial on it. So let's see. Ooh, look at this. Marabou art crayons. Okay, so these I've never used before. These, I know somebody wanted to see me try it on a live stream, so I'll try these. I, let me see what they look like. <laughs> Use a palette knife to open this. Let's see. Okay. Cute. Yeah, I've never used these before, so that would be really fun. And there's one more thing in here. Ooh, look, it's a Posca set. Oh, I'm so excited because I only have a red and black Posca. And I was like, I need the other colors. So thank you. You guys are so great. And then the other one, this one, another one. Let's see what this one is. Oh my God, I need these so bad, you guys. My brush pens are so dead. Thank you all. This, this is so helpful. So remember, that is a way that you can enter the raffle. Okay. Apexia says, how often should I start a work? Because in my case, I struggle with starting from a list of works I have in my list. And if I start, I get bored and skip to the other. I never work on one piece at a time. I usually have like five pieces in progress. Actually, do I have it here? No, I had a little sticky <laughs> that listed all the things. Well, I have an editing sticky, this is what it is. I have these stickies where it's like, these are five artworks I'm working on right now. And it's okay to do that. 
I do the same. I get bored. I do something else. So I sort of ping pong between the various pieces. And you know something? There's actually a lot of work I never finish. People think that you should finish everything you make, but that's not true. I have so many pieces that I started and just never got back to them. That's okay. You're not a worse artist. The only time that you must finish is if you have a deadline or it's commissioned or something like that. Other than that, or if you're preparing a portfolio, but if you're not doing one of those two things, there's no pressure to finish. Finishing is important. It is a skill to develop. I don't think everybody learns it overnight, but unless you have a really compelling reason why you must finish, don't put pressure on yourself to do that. Reminder, everybody, if you give a super chat or sticker during the stream, that does enter you into our raffle, which is going through December 9th because, oh, you guys, we still haven't gotten our Instagram back. But I think I found the workaround. I think I, I'm doing it right now. But so I found a very long, complicated, detailed post. Somebody said they got it back by you have to have a Facebook page. And they said that if you take out an ad, that taking out an ad gives you access to Facebook business support. And he says, you just tell them and you can go on chat with them. You tell them that your Facebook page got hacked. But then when they're on the chat, you tell them it's my Instagram that got hacked and they said they got it back. So like, Basically, Meta doesn't want to give you support unless you're paying the money, which I guess makes sense. But I'm like, could you guys just stop lying? Could you stop telling us that this link restores your account? Could you just not tell us that you'll do it in three to four business days? Like, just say we won't. Like, just be honest. Like, none of this lying. That makes me mad. <laughs> you guys really like the unboxing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Heart R, for the super sticker. Keep up with the amazing and enthusiastic show. You guys are so fantastic. Thank you all for helping. And William says, how should I stop my dip nibs from rusting? Should I dip them in oil? I'm actually not sure about that. I'm going to say probably not. Because Kat is our dip pen queen. I've never seen her dip them in oil. So I'm not going to give you the perfect answer, but I think just constantly cleaning them, not letting the ink dry up would be a very important thing. Art Fossil says, I can't wait to see our prof do more history videos. It's been so helpful for my creative practice. I had wonderful teachers that made it very broad and interesting. That's it. I tell a lot of college kids, listen, a lot of people will go to college or, or any other place you're learning. And let's say you're picking classes and they'll say, oh, well, I really love this class about Hugh Jackman. So I'm going to take this class about Hugh Jackman. <laughs> and people are like, oh, it's going to be great. But it's like, I, and I'm not kidding here. Even a really bad teacher could make Hugh Jackman boring. Like it, it's astounding how much a bad teacher can make you not care about the subject. But in college, I also had professors who taught classes in subjects I really could have cared less about, but they were such good teachers that I loved the subject. And so, so much of it is about the delivery of the teaching is what impacts everything so, so much. Remember everybody, if you want to save Lauren from my wrath, enter the raffle. You can get the link in the YouTube video description below because again, we pick up the checks. We don't ask you. We just ask you twice a year to get your support. And it's thanks to these incredible top Patreon supporters. You guys are it. If we lose you, we're gone. 
we're out of here. I shut down the YouTube channel. That's what happens if we don't have that support. You guys are keeping it alive. Visit artprof.org. There's tons of content that's not on YouTube. Art Prof has a podcast that's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And by the way, everybody, no Discord chat because I'm still under the weather. But I had a lot of fun hanging out with all of you tonight. Subscribe to our channel for more tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Otherwise, Buddy is going to stare at you. Have a good night, everybody. I'll see you next time. Bye.